Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome back to another episode of Catching One on One TV. My name is Dan Barksdale. I'll be your host. Uh, I'm always excited about the guests we have on the show to help you guys learn a little bit more about the, the catching position. Uh, but, but today I'm really excited because we have a guest uh, who's unbelievably knowledgeable in an area that, that I'm definitely lacking in. And I feel like I'm going to learn as much as anybody from this episode. Uh, the guest is a former LSU Tiger. Uh, he's a clinical and sports psychologist. He works at the University of Alabama. He also works with a number of professional athletes, uh, a lot of golfer, men's, men's and women's golfers. Uh, so without further ado, let's welcome Brett, Dr. Brett McCabe. Hey, thanks for having me. It's always nice to get back a battery back together, right? That's right. Yeah. Exactly right. Got to have, got to have some help back here. Exactly. Exactly. We used to always say at LSU, you know, we would, sometimes we'd take two different buses, um, and, and it was always the athletes bus and the non-athletes and the athletes were always the pitchers and catchers. So, um, <laughs> you know, we made sure of that. So. There you go. Well, well Brett, nobody I, signs I, up to be the right fielder, right? Nobody in like fifth grade or first grade goes, I want to be the right fielder. Everybody wants to be the pitcher, the catcher, the shortstop, or the center fielder. I mean, come on. That's it. So, or hit all the time. It was just hit all the time. Or, or, or full time, all time hitter. <laughs> yeah, no yeah. doubt. Well, 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 definitely, man, I appreciate you coming on. Like I said in, in the intro, this is something I'm super interested in talking about. Um, I know I didn't do you justice in the intro, so I'd love for you to take a few minutes <laughs> and, and let, you know, let everybody kind of know a little bit more about your background and exactly what you do. Yeah, so I'm a uh, clinical psychologist, and what that means is I'm, I'm a licensed psychologist that um, is trained in the, the spectrum of the way people's emotions work, and I'm a specialist in um, the way that the people's emotions work with medical conditions, chronic pain, headache, back pain, rehab, injury, things like that. Um, but what got me into it was being a baseball player at LSU. I had a shoulder injury my third year, um, and you know, looking back at it, you know, they, they thought it was like a biceps tendonitis or an impingement. I probably tore the labrum in my shoulder. Um, and, and that was at a really critical time for me because I was a red shirt freshman. I red shirted my freshman year. We won the national title. Um, I came back the next year. I wasn't very good. I wasn't ready to play. And I knew that coming into the program, my coach told me, look, you're going to be a red shirt and you're just going to be about a third year. You're about a three year plan. Um, and I was the youngest kid in my class. I matured late, everything. I was on a very different cycle. Um, and right going into my third year, I had, in my second year, not only not being good enough, I also had mono, missed six weeks of the season, had to go home and all this other stuff. So when I come back in the fall of that year, all of a sudden, man, I, I kind of look like you. I was fit as hell. I was strong. I'd been in the gym. I was moving to heavy weights. Now you got to remember back then, this is early 90s, Baseball players really didn't do a lot of strength training. We pitchers would train like the third baseman, but I started working with a specialist and I got really strong, really fast and started throwing really hard. And um, this confidence was just exuding. And then after the fall camp, I, uh, my shoulder just locked up and I really struggled with it. Um, I tried to come back. I changed my throwing mechanics inadvertently. I didn't do it on purpose. Um, and I lost my mechanics. And I think that's why I, I, I respect the yips so much is that I lost my mechanics. And, you know, every time I'd go in the bullpen before game and they would try to get me back in the rotation, you know, they would say, Hey, why, why is your hands breaking this way? Why are you throwing that way? What are you doing? And coach Bianco, who was your coach and, you know, we're in the, in the bullpen. And he's like, Hey, look, you're doing this, you're doing that. And I was so confused and it wasn't their fault. Um, the season was moving on and we win the title that year. Um, and you know, it was one of those things where I felt, I felt very left behind and I felt, even though I was there, I was in the dog pile, I was part of it, but I wasn't, I was an outsider. I'd only thrown 10 or 12 innings. I mean, it was minimal. And, um, you know, by the time that the season came back around for my next year, I was ready to quit. I was done. I, I couldn't regain the velocity. I'd lost my mechanics. My thrown motion looked completely different. What I'd done since I was five was done. You know, I had to think consciously how to throw. And I went to a guy going into my, going into the season that was really a hypnotherapist. I mean, he did relaxation, visualization stuff and it unlocked me. And I ended up having a phenomenal season. I never was the same pitcher, um, but I had a phenomenal season. Um, I was, I led the team in appearances and I had the lowest DRA. And I mean, I was just like 10 or 12 stats in the SEC. I was in the top 10. 
Um, and I really wasn't that good, but I realized the power of the mind. So after that season, I changed my major to psychology and thought, okay, there's something to it and played one more year, had a good year, um, had a really good year. And then I wasn't, I, I wasn't a pro prospect anymore. Um, after I was injured. And so um, I went into psychology and I was always fascinated by the, what what it takes for people to break through, to find their, to get out of their slumps and stuff and to find their, their greatness. Um, and, uh, and so I worked when I graduated and I finished my internship. So psychologists do four to five years of graduate training and then a one year residency. Um, I did my residency at Brown up in Rhode Island at the Brown Medical School. And when I got done, it was 2002, 9-11 had happened while I was on internship and uh, the, the, the job climate was a little different. So I took a job in the pharmaceutical industry and I worked in the pharma industry for about eight years. And it was a really good experience to, to understand corporate excellence, corporate integrity, corporate, and people will say, oh, integrity in pharmaceuticals, trust me, which you read in the newspapers and stuff like that, just bypass all that. Um, and and so then I decided, um, I started working with golfers. I was always an avid golfer. Our team at LSU, we'd get away to go play golf. Um, half the guys would go hunting and fishing. The other guys would end up at the golf course. And so um, I was always fascinated. So I just started helping kids out in my local club. Just they would know what I did. And I'd say, hey, do this, do that. And next thing you know, those kids got really, really good. And and I was very fortunate to be in some circles of some very prominent players and Next thing you know, I'm on the PGA tour working with clients and I just kind of approached it from being a pitcher, like what do pitchers do? And it's worked. And my clients have been very successful. Like I said, sometimes the coach is successful because they have successful players and that's me. Um, but one of my guys won the U S open just recently. And, um, you know, I've had probably 15, 20 wins on the PGA tour in the last five years. So it's a cool job. I work with other sports and other athletes, but golf is where people tend to know me um, and, and tend to relate to. It's a great job. It's, uh, you know, for this week, as we're recording this, the British Open is going to be going on. I'll be getting up at two o'clock in the morning here to not only watch, but to be available for FaceTimes and to get guys ready to go. So, I mean, come on, what, what a better job is that? No doubt. We'll definitely wish you and uh, your athletes the best of luck. And I appreciate you sharing yeah, you. that story because I, I think a lot of people, you know, relate to things more and they know that you've been on both sides of the equation. Uh, yeah. you're, you're not just some guy that's, you know, seen it from one perspective. You've been an athlete, you've been through arm issues um, and you've bounced back uh, because of it. I am absolutely 100% positive that people are going to want to follow up with you after watching this or maybe sometime in the future if they find it at a later date. Um, so where can people find you on the web and social media and so on and so forth? So, so everything is my name. So, but I spell my name differently. So I spell my name B H R E T T and then it's McCabe M C C A B E. So if you go to Brett you'll find me. If you go on the social media channels, it's at Dr. Brett McCabe. Um, and, and the reason I say I spell my name differently is I started spelling it with an H when I was in kindergarten and it just stuck. And so literally I did it and I'm the one that has complicated everything, but, um, you know, it's, it's, that's how you can find me. And, and I'm active on social media. Um, it's, uh, I, I'm try I try to do my best as a 48 year old dude to understand things. Um, I don't understand TikTok. I watch the videos. Don't know what the hell I'm watching. <laughs> I understand Twitter, Facebook, I, whatever Instagram. I enjoy, I, I you know, I, I love watching Instagram for videos on fun, you know, bourbon and uh, barbecues. And then for some reason, my feed on my search engine is full of bikinis. And I keep telling my daughter who runs my social media account, I'm not clicking anything. But she's like, they know you're a 48 year old man. So they're feeding your system like that. I'm like, please let your mom know that I'm not doing this. But I'm not complaining either. So anyway, yeah, same thing happens to me. I, you know, I know it's amazing. It, it, it's unbelievable. I don't know how that happens, yeah. but uh, the it, algorithm, exactly. just chalk it up to the algorithm, I guess. It, it's a hundred percent the algorithm. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. but no, it, it, that's funny. The, the reason I say people are going to want to follow up with you. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on uh, is because when I was actually on your podcast a couple of years ago, we spoke about it and then uh, the world's been crazy for the past year. And we're finally just getting <laughs> yeah. around to, to catching up again. But I get more emails um, than I think most people would expect about the yips. You know, I think a lot of people yeah. 
think that it's uh, it's it's rare it never happens it only happens to a guy once in a blue moon um, but I can tell you firsthand I get emails a lot and my typical response over the past I don't know year and a half or two years or however long it's been since we've known each other is I usually say hey there's a guy and I refer him to you um, so mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to learning a lot more about it um because it's it's a very scary subject for a lot of people um i think one of the uh, i'll tell you a quick story uh so so you know how it's relevant but i was at camp a couple of years ago and i have every fall i have what's called the elite throwing camp it's a throwing camp all we're doing is improving footwork improving mechanics talking about arm care talking about recovery talking about arm strength it's just the entire day is about mechanics or, or, or throwing um and I had a player probably three years ago. He showed up and he, and he was in the thick of it. He was in the middle of the yips. We, we, he couldn't get through any of the drills. Um, he, he couldn't hit his partner in the chest. And he's throwing it, hitting the seat, literally hitting the ceiling, hitting yeah. it halfway. And I felt helpless as a coach. Now, I'm at a camp and my camps are small and I get to spend a lot of one on one time with guys, but this was not something that I could fix in a 12 hour day. Uh, this was something that it, it, it needed to be uh, addressed by a professional. It needs to be followed up on. Um, and, and so from my perspective, it was like, holy crap, what do I do? Um, so it, it's real and it's scary. And I know the oh, guys yeah. who are going through it, uh, you know, have a difficult time. So I think just to start, I, I know I've kind of got my definition of the yips. I'm sure most people watching or listening have theirs as well, but I'd love to kind of go ahead and hear your definition first so that we can kind of all get on the same page and then kind of move forward. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, to me, I don't look at the yips as like a neurological condition or a uh, a constraining definition. I look at it as a behavioral expression. Okay, it's a symptom. It, it's just the way I describe something. So it's that's an important um, delineation because I've had somebody call and say, "Would you, you know, would you agree that they have the yips or not?" I'm like, "Yeah," but it doesn't mean that it's bad. The yips to me are when we lose the natural freedom of what we used to do. And now the fix that we're trying to create is causing worse problems. So let me describe what happens. So I look at the yips like panic attacks as a clinician, because they're almost identical. Let me explain. So you and I are throwing a, a throw back from the catcher to the pitcher, a pitcher to first base, a second baseman to first base. Those are where the yips happen in baseball. Okay. Why? They're the easiest throws in the game. Now, we take them for granted. So for a long time, I you can throw back to me and have a small mechanical flaw. That's fine. You overcome it. You hit me in the chest. No big deal. All of a sudden, it's not good anymore. You overthrow me. You make a mistake. And all of a sudden, there's a sense of embarrassment that comes in and frustration and anger, usually embarrassment. And now what happens is you start trying to correct it and protect it. Let me not do it again. And let me try to, okay, turn my shoulders, extend, flip my wrist. And you start doing all these fixes, right? And the fix causes more frustration. And just like me throwing mechanically, I become so focused on the mechanics that I lose the chain of events that create it. Now, what happens in a panic attack? And let me explain this. So let me use a male as an example, because this is usually the the beautiful example. 48-year-old male like me sitting in their office, drinks four cups of coffee in the morning, is running around like crazy, sitting in the office at two o'clock in the afternoon, all of a sudden it's like, oh my God, I got chest pain. And feels a little stressed and feels like, you know, tingling in the arm, you know, may actually vomit, gets, you know, sweats, um, headache, you know, heart racing, all this other stuff. They go to the emergency room call the ambulance, the ambulance comes and takes them, take them to the emergency room. The emergency room physician comes out and goes, well, you didn't have a heart attack. It's just stress. It's just stress, which is a very dismissive statement, right? Like it's the littlest thing you should be able to overcome it. And now that guy has to go back and tell everybody it was just stress. I mean, I just brought everybody in here. Um, all right. So what happens is so that dude goes back to work and I was like, are you okay? I mean, heart attack, you t-? now they say it was just stress, but I, it, 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 it felt like a heart attack. Well, now, not only do they have embarrassment, they have fear of it returning. And the system had a false alarm that acted just like a true alarm. The alarm system went off, but it was coming. What that alarm system is trying to tell the body is we got a major issue. And now 
that cycle continues. Well, there's two factors that create it lasting. Those two factors are this. Number one is that there's embarrassment, that there's this loss of control and fear of embarrassment. You know, you, you, you're in a public place, you don't want people to be aware of it. And then the second part is avoidance. All you want to do is get out of it and avoid it. And you start fearing it coming back. Okay, now let's go back to throwing for a minute. Every single time I've heard this from catchers, and you've probably heard this too. I overthrew it and I got razzed by the pitcher. The coach told me if I can't catch it again, if I can't throw the damn ball back to the pitcher. I had a catcher that told me, you know, he hit the indoor facility on his first day at college and he was high recruit. And the coaches just got all over him. The senior pitchers made fun of him. We had a kid my freshman year was in my recruiting class. He ended up playing pretty well in the minor leagues for a long time. But, you know, the younger guys would just razz him every time he overthrew first base. Um, it, and it becomes this, it takes over the mind because that false alarm is that something's wrong. What's really wrong? We made a bad throw. But what it's identifying is I can't do this. Why can't I do this? This should be the easiest freaking thing in the world. What's the problem? Why am I struggling? All those other things. And the anxiety builds. So every throw becomes about relief. It doesn't, and so you hit the person close enough, you're like, oh, phew, I got to do it again in a minute. And so what happens is that false alarm system continues. So what we have to do is realize, and, and the best way to do it is that I called the yip guy, Bob. Bob's here today. Okay. Bob, the yip dude's here. I don't know why Bob showed up today. Don't know why I'm having a hard time throwing. But when Bob's here, I don't need to go faster. I need to allow myself to sit in it. It's okay. I understand that I can play if Bob's here. Cool. All right. What do I want to do? I'm not going to focus on mechanics. I'm not going to try to correct the mechanical flaw. What I'm going to do is just make an agreement. Whatever I'm going to do, if I throw it into center field or I bounce it, I'm going to do it with glory. I'm going to do it fully. So what? And I go with that attitude of, I can do it with Bob here and I can start throwing back. And it's funny what happens is once you separate that idea that it's really like this external thing called Bob, people feel better because at least they, they don't feel like they are failing when it's going wrong. More along the lines of, hey, I get it. It's Bob. No big deal. It's hilarious when you think about it, but it's what works. And, but does it go away? Not for a while. I've got a guy on the PJ Tour I'm working with right now who I'm sure is still frustrated that it pops up on some short putts. That's where it usually happens in putting, chipping, or driving the ball. Um, free throw shooters, that happens to them. And, and I always tell them, look, I can't reduce the frequency until you reduce the intensity of it. And once the intensity starts going down, the duration goes down, which will stop the frequency from happening. But it's Bob will show up on the weirdest times. And when it happens, you just have to go, okay, Bob, I hear it. It's not a failure of me. I don't suck. I'm not terrible. Okay, what do I want to do? I don't want them to go into any fancy throwing mechanics. Because as a catcher, you and I can sit 60 feet, six inches apart. Your feet can be four feet apart and turn sideways and you'll hit me in the target every time. Okay. But what do we do is we start teaching them. Okay. Hey, make sure we turn our shoulders, make sure we extend, make sure we, 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 and now they're caught up back here. I want them caught up out there. Let's, let's, let's hit a button. Let's just focus on the button and F it. Who cares? Let it rip. Like if you overthrow, just tell your center fielder to be ready. Yeah. And as a pitcher, you need to tell them, look guys, I'm working through this. I don't need you to shame me on the mound. Like, just help me out here. I help you out. You help me out. Yeah. I, th I think that's a great way to put it. Um, I, I feel like, you know, there's a couple of camps. Uh, when when you have a player that starts to deal with some of these issues or, or Bob shows up, um, the, the first thing that I think most coaches say is just, holy crap, just avoid it. Do not talk about it. We'll just hopefully it'll go away on its own. Uh, if we don't bring it up, he's not going to think about it. Would you say yeah, that's yeah, good advice or it. bad advice? Well, no, he's, he's thinking it. about it. Yeah. I had an elite catcher um, last year that I work with privately. And this kid, we were getting him ready for, you know, drafts and stuff like that. And he calls me, he goes, oh, my God, I overthrew the, I overthrew the pitcher. Um, it was the last practice before a big game. He's like, oh my. I said, hey, if it happens, own it. 
just own it. Okay. And when you, when you can turn it into something where it's like, I can't be beaten by it. It's not going to destroy. It's not a life. It's not a fatal diagnosis. Okay. Mm -hmm. The Mackie Sasser days are gone. Um, where, or the Chuck Knobloch where we had to move players into other, you know, avenues because we didn't know what to do. Because what, think about what happens. Okay. I want to talk about it, but I also don't want to over flood them with information. I don't want to ignore it because they're not ignoring it, but I also don't want to be like, okay, okay, okay. Let's work on our throwing mechanics. What I'd rather do is like, hey, he's here. Do you have a plan? You have a plan when Bob shows up? Because once we realize that I have a plan when Bob shows up, Bob's not as powerful. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're talking about mechanics because I, I do feel like that, that's the other thing. You know, There's always a mechanical flaw that starts it. Always. So there is. So it does yeah, usually 100%. typically start. Yeah. Yep. But, but the thing about the mechanical flaw is they were able to overcome it forever. Yeah. Like it was no big, like, you know, you can see somebody who's, let, let's say he's got a hole in their swing, right? But they've always been able to overcome it until they couldn't. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden now we're trying to fix this. And what happens? They can't. Sometimes I, I had a golf instructor tell me something that was really brilliant that I think is what we should all follow. He said, and this is a, a national world, worldly golf coach. He said, when I'm coaching players and we're making swing changes, much like what you're making on the mechanics or anything like that, there's something that the best athletes in the world do that's just special. Now we all have a special something that we do, mm -hmm. but the best of the best, they just, uh, somebody has not tried to eliminate that special from them. And he said, I, I'll give you an example. He said, X, Y, Z player, when he makes his transition, he widens. There's no way in hell I could teach that, but it's a world-class move. But when we're working on mechanics, he doesn't widen. Okay. So he said, use to get him to allow him to widen. He doesn't even consciously realize he's doing that. You know what I mean? Like cognitively, the, his neuroscience is doing something that is just freedom. If you watch, uh, it, it's a really cool thing to watch. Like, um, like in golf, if you ever work with somebody who was a uh, like a girl who was a cheerleader, they have tremendous awareness of where their limbs are in a golf swing. They have to, right? That's why they usually gymnasts that phase out of gym, gymnastics end up in diving a lot because they just know where their body is in space extraordinarily well. Those are superpowers and that they've refined over time. Um, you know, pitchers, you know, one of the things that I love about some of the new technology is that, you know, like Rapsodo or stuff like that, as a pitcher, I would recognize that of like how to get more spin. Like I, could, I can feel that. Well, you know when a ball's going in the dirt. You put a third baseman back there, they don't. You can see down angle. You, you're predicting those things. Well, let's not obscure the natural mechanics of, of you as a thrower. Because when you're throwing to second base, well, Steph Curry goes out and practices three-pointers, and there's times that he's working on getting his feet aligned. Well, he's in a game. His feet may be pointing to the bench. But he's still got enough there that he knows what he's doing because he, he did the right training. So what I want catchers to do is on throwing back or whatever is realize there may be a mechanical flaw there, but if we go in there and try to fix that, we may cause more disruption. And most of the time they've been able to overcome it for a long time until they couldn't. The stress got big, the pressure got big, the embarrassment got big. Yeah. I think that's good advice. You know, one thing that I'm curious for, and I want to attack this from a couple of different angles because I know the people sure. listening, there are going, going to be some coaches, there are going to be some parents, and there are going to be some catchers who are going through it all themselves. I, I want to ask a question from the coach's side. So if, if I'm a coach and there's a player on my team, uh, whether it be a catcher throwing back to the mound or a second baseman throwing to first, whatever it is, when do you think would be the right time to address it? Obviously, you see a catcher overthrow the pitcher one time. You know, that, that's, that's too premature. Uh, do you want to let it go on for a month? Probably not. You probably want to address it before that. What would be your advice for a coach who maybe sees signs of, of a player who is starting to go through this, um, but they want to be cautious, but they want to be, uh, you know, proactive as well? I, I would read the body language. 
and when they, when they start looking defeated, that's usually a pretty good time to get involved. One of the best things a coach could do is say, Hey, I've got this. You're not my first. You won't be my last. I got you. It's kind of like walking into a doctor or a surgeon and you're like, you know, and they tell you, Oh, Hey, you know, I've done 5,000 of these surgeries. Like we, we're good. I got this. Yeah. And you're like, okay, I'm just one. That's what a coach. I, I, I think that was one of the things that made coach Bertman so good is he used to always say that I got this guys. I've done this 10,000 times. You haven't trust me. Like I want a pilot who's flying an airplane. It's like, I got this. Like yeah. one of the things I, I heard on a flight one time getting on, I fly all the time. I'm a diamond flyer, million mile or whatever. And, um, the Delta pilots get up on the front and they're like, Hey, today in the cockpit, we have, um, two pilots with 50 years of flying experience. Both of us have 20 years experience in the air force and the Navy is flying fighter jets. We're okay up here today, guys. So we've got you covered. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna relax. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's, that's, that makes me feel pretty good. Right. But what that sign is showing me as a coach, me is what I do is that I got competence. The big thing for you, me, their coach is to say, Hey, we got this. Like we got, is it going to be hard? Oh, hell yeah. It's going to be hard. And is it going to pop up out of the blue? Hell yeah. But can you deal with it? Can you accept this? Because if you can accept the fact that Bob's going to show up at the time you don't want, like you're going to be in the sixth inning of a game, the ninth inning of a game, and all of a sudden it's going to pop up in your head and all of a sudden go, don't overthrow the pitcher. All right. Bob just showed up. Bob always attacks us at our weakest moments, mm. our most volatile moments. So what are you going to do? You know what? When Bob comes, I'm gonna take a couple deep breaths. I'm gonna eff it. I'm gonna hit the. I'm gonna hit the the button, okay? Or whatever the mechanism is that we come with that make it work. Okay, just like panic attacks. The fastest way to get some. I've had panic attacks. They're brutal. Okay, I, I remember when I had them in grad school. Um, I was on an airplane. I felt like I was gonna vomit. My I had the full symptom of full adrenaline rush. Everything. Um, and I, I avoided eating in public. I avoided going in certain things in public. I'd always sit by the door in class, three hour classes, right by the door. I didn't tell anybody I was going through it. Um, but what I did is I said, you know what? I'm gonna start teaching myself to expose myself. I'd sit further and further in. After I would go eat outside, I would sit further and further in. I remember sitting in a McDonald's on our campus and moving chairs after every lunch, deeper and deeper in. Once you realize that it doesn't own you, you have control. Hmm. Once you realize it's not going to break you, it's not going to destroy you, that you can endure the storm, you've got control. And in panic attacks, once somebody has a panic attack in front of you and you realize that they can ride the wave versus fight the wave, most of what we do is we fight. Instead of fight, just ride it. Just roll with it. Like, it's here, okay? Hey, second baseman shortstop, just be prepared. I mean... It is what it is. I do, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got the quickest pop time going down to second base on the team. I'm the best blocker of the ball. It's just one little area that I struggle. Yeah. Like I'm in control of it. I get it. I think that's a great perspective. Away. Yeah. And I, and I love, I love hearing your answers because you're doing a, a fantastic job. Um, I, and I've got a lot of questions, so I'm just going to keep mm -hmm. these things coming. And, and sometimes they might veer off a little bit, uh, go no, on a tangent fine. just because there's so many interesting, you know, concepts to talk about. Um, you, you know, as we're talking about this, and I think you're giving some great advice, uh, you know, what you just said for the coaches is phenomenal. And I know each case is going to be completely independent. There's not a, there's probably not a cookie cutter type case, but in your experience, what, I don't know if you can say an average time or an, maybe an expected time, but if you wanted to give somebody going through this realistic expectations, um, is there, are you even able to do that? Or is each case just so, so realistically different? Each case is so different. What, what you can't do, which is the natural thing to do is get frustrated when it shows up and think that you're wrong for doing it. My answer is, well, this is what you have to deal with. Somebody else can have to deal with something else. Yeah. Okay. This is just what your burden. This is just the burden that you have to endure. Don't know why. What can you learn about yourself with this? Is it that important? Yeah. I want to play. Okay. And it was the same thing for me. I had to find, I, I got to a spot throwing before I kind of figured it out, which was, I couldn't catch my, I couldn't get my, my rhythm throwing. Every fastball I threw felt different. 
And I felt like one time my hand was above my, uh, in front of my feet. And the next time I was behind my feet, I was, my weight was, I, I was just terrible. Right. And it's such a lost feeling because you've been doing this since you're five. Even to this day, I still dream of throwing without having to consciously think about it. Um, and I get it. I get it. You know, in golf, you know, you don't want that three footer to get you. You don't, but it, it happens. It happens to the best players in the world. What you have to do is realize is like, hey, I, I, I know what I'm doing and I can endure this. It's not get over. We don't get over this. It'll come back 10 years from now. That's what's crazy. Like once that little doubt pops in our head, it's planted. We all have it. It's all at risk for every one of us. Center fielders don't get the yips because they can throw a ball and it can sail on them 20 feet. I mean, the shortstop's going to slide over and nobody's going to say anything about it. I mean, my God, Johnny Damon played how long in the major leagues he couldn't throw for the crap. Okay. Um, but once it happens to one of those high profile positions where it looks so easy, you, what you have to realize is I'm doing what most people can't do. And every day I'm in this and going further, I'm doing what other people can't do. Most people would run, quit, cut bait, try to find a new position. Um, but, and the worst part is if we just go out and throw by ourselves, it's easy. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, there's pressure. So understand how pressure impact. All those things is that dialogue of, of creating that process in our mind of, okay, dude, listen, you can do this. And yeah. let's figure out a way. Look, it, it, it was so prevalent, right? That the, uh, the, you know, the greatest, second greatest baseball movie ever of you know, major league, major league two, probably the worst sequel of all time, um, had a, it, the catcher couldn't throw and had to think about centerfolds, right? He had to distract him, distract Baker. himself. And that's, yep. Yep. So, but yes, I still stand. Sh Bull Durham is number one. Major league is number two. I know people love field of dreams, not a fan. The natural's good. Um, eight men out was fantastic. Um, I got to put Sandlot somewhere in there. I know. We have Never to seen it. it. Oh, holy cow. It. Well, guys, I'm going go to watch this podcast I, short. We're going to finish right. I, but see, it's generational. You're younger than me. Yeah. I I didn't – I've tried to watch it on an airplane. I was like, whatever. I turned it off. But I also the same guy who couldn't get through Pulp Fiction. Yeah. And I love Quentin Tarantino movies. But to me, you know, The Natural was good. I was a little young when that came out. Field of Dreams was fine. I mean, dear friend of mine, Coach Murphy, Patrick Murphy at – at um at alabama softball is from iowa and he goes out there and he loves it and i'm like uh, bull durham's better yeah. he's like oh my god no way um you know that's the cool thing about baseball we all have our romantic nature to whatever the one Absolutely. is that gets us um I, I still like what was the one with tom Selleck going to play in japan i love that movie um uh, uh, oh gosh uh, the rookie, not the rookie. They the Shuto. But... The Shuto is the slider he couldn't hit. Uh, yeah, exactly. Mr. Love that Mr. movie. Mr. Baseball. Mr. Baseball. Mr. Baseball. Love that yeah, movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, but Bull Durham to me is still yeah. the best. Well, we'll, we'll have, have to have another podcast just on baseball movies. That might be a yeah. good yeah. A good topic to bring up. Um, now, you, you're giving a lot of really good advice to things to do. Uh, I, I'm curious, though. Are there any, Earlier, I mentioned the avoidance or what do you do. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that comes to your, to your mind immediately if I say, what should a parent or a coach or, you know, not do? What, what, what would be like the worst thing you can do for somebody who has the and, – and the reason I ask that is because I'm sure it happens all the time. I think there's a lot of people who just, they don't know how to attack this and they have the best of intentions. Uh, but kind of like you said earlier, they, they may just go about it the complete wrong way where they're just trying to make overly uh, large mechanical adjustments or they talk about it all the time. They bring it up. They don't know how to approach it. Is there anything that you would say, like, definitely don't do this. This is probably not going to put us in the right direction. I think flooding people with mechanical fixes is probably the worst thing you can do. So I'll use golf, for example. You know, what happens on a short putt when somebody misses it is everybody in the group will go, oh my God, it looked like you decelled. Well, yeah, you decel on every putt you hit. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I'll tell putters is, look, you're going to miss the putts. So at least let's, let's just make a good swing. Um, you know, so to me, flooding them like, hey, make sure you, you turn. You look like you didn't turn your shoulders. So now a catcher throwing to 60 feet is making a full shoulder turn. Well, now they're having to put on the brakes on that throw or they're going to knock their pitcher over. Um, 
I almost would rather them stay, you know, completely open to them and throw. They tend to have no problem doing it that way. Really, they don't. Mm -hmm. um, I want to simplify, but flooding them with mechanical things. You know, it's kind of like when, you know, parents or kids on the team are like, hey, just throw strikes. Yeah, no yeah. kidding. <laughs> yeah, sounds yeah, easy. Okay. Thank you. That was novel. Thank you. Great idea. Yeah. Love that. And that's what happens, right? You know, it's like we flood people with mechanical um, things and that just doesn't work. Yeah. So, you know, let's, let's just say, Hey, let's, let's throw their next 10. And let's see how it goes. In other words, let's expand the landscape here. Let's expand the landscape of what we're doing. It yeah. doesn't need to be right now. Well, you know? I, I think it becomes obvious, you know, as I'm talking to you that th this is, this is a psychological issue. Um, and no, no disrespect to coaches. I mean, myself included, I, I don't have any formal education in psychology. I, th there's, there's a lot of things that I don't know. And that's why when somebody comes to me with something like this, um, you know, I, I try to refer them, you know, I've been referring them to you and, and send them, yeah. send them your email address. But um, I want coaches to know how to deal with this though. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, because the, the first thing is it's, if I'm a catcher and I overthrow it, I'll look over to my coach and they're like this in the dugout. I know it. Like, like, don't, don't shame me. Yeah. Don't shame me. I yeah. mean, look, I've dealt with coaches that can't hit fungos anymore. I've got coaches who lost their ability to throw BP happens. Things like that happen to all of us. It's, it's, we're not immune to things like this. The easier it is, the more at risk it is. Yeah. Well, why is it so taboo? Why do you feel like people just don't want to talk about it or don't want to know about it? I mean, what? What is because that? we don't understand it. Yeah. We think that it's, it's contagious, right? Like it's, it's fatal. I mean, it's like, Oh my God. Oh my God. What do we do about this? You know, we had to move Chuck Knobloch out to left field. Um, Steve Sachs syndrome. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's this taboo thing when really it's just part of the game. I mean, yeah. I had the yips chipping, um, and, you know, I, I knew exactly what it was. I mean, I had a mechanical flaw that, uh, that needed to be fixed. Um, but what I did is I found my way to fix it. And, but I, I would chip before people would look. I play golf a lot now, but I would chip before people would watch. I would try to chip before people got to the green. I would try, in other words, I was trying to get anybody, I was trying to get done before anybody could see me. Look, the best thing we can do is, you know, I would, if I was a coach, I would tell the pitchers, Hey, show some, show some compassion. Don't be a jerk. Okay. This dude does, this guy's in the dirt for you on every pitch. Okay. Don't, don't shame him when he doesn't throw it back. Say, I got it. I mean, he doesn't shame you when you bounce a fastball. Okay. Or you miss a sign. Mm -hmm. he, he owns it. You own it. Shortstop second baseman. You just kind of continue to, to go behind. It's no big deal. Yeah. Like nobody make a big deal about it. Just keep rolling. Like, Hey, you got this. Come on. I, I think one of the other misconceptions, you know, kind of building off that, I think one of the misconceptions I hear, um, and, and it's crazy how the world of, you know, baseball and, and really all sports, there's a lot of parallels to the military, you know, over the past probably 10, mm -hmm. 15 years of guys are going through seal training and you have you know, all the books have come out and this and that. And, and so mental toughness, I think has always been, um, an important part of baseball and sports, but I feel like over the past decade or, or two decades, you, you know, you have a lot more mental performance coaches and mental toughness experts and, and, and so on and so forth. And I think one of the things that happens is people think that, Oh my gosh, if I got the yips, this he, he's got to be mentally weak. He, he, he's just got to get over it yeah. and he's got to be done with it. And he, if he doesn't, he's mentally weak. Um, and I think that's obviously, you know, not true. Well, I think most things that happen in the mental field, that's kind of where we've, gone for a long time right like i remember when i was playing in the early 90s if i went and saw i went and saw this guy but i told people i was going to the eye doctor uh, at first and my roommate uh, todd walker was like dude you're not going to the eye doctor every week I'm like yeah you're right um and you know i told him and then finally i started telling more people the the mental side because we don't understand it we can't measure it we i mean we really can't we can't you know, like I can take somebody in the weight room and show velocity changes. I can show strength changes, flexibility. I can't really in the mental game. So it's this black box of unknowing. So there is always a little bit of a, um, 
mystery to it. And as a result, there's a stigma associated with it. And, and some of that is, is due to my field. Um, you know, we've got some people in the field. I remember we had a couple guys that would come out to LSU when I was playing and they've never, you could tell they'd never thrown a ball in their life. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but you could just tell they didn't relate, but they were big fans. They loved it, but you could just, I mean, wearing, you know, sandals, Birkenstocks with, with black socks. I mean, it's like, okay, it's hard to relate. I think baseball's done a wonderful job with the inclusion of the mental performance coach. I think one of the things that we're going to continue to see is, is what's the, what's the hierarchy of mental performance. Um, I think if you looked at it, like you've got the former players who figured out the mental cue that really don't have any training, but they're really good. I mean, there's some really good ones that do that. They have a very clear understanding and they may teach from what they knew and what they went through. And then you have the mental performance coaches who are trained in the, the performance paradigms. Um, they're going to have their processes and they're not going to really be able to handle the secondary stuff or the outside stuff because they're trained in only performance. Um, and, but they serve a fantastic role. And if you look at minor league baseball, they're integrating people throughout the, the, um, the, the, the teams. Um, and then you move to the, the psychologists um, and the clinical psychologists and then, and, and up that it's just, they go deeper into more of the personal. It doesn't mean that I'm immediately going to go into how, you know, what's your relationship with your mom, but it's just the fact that I have a better understanding of the psychological fingerprint of somebody um, because I can see the entire paradigm. Um, and so what I want to do is destigmatize. Uh, I want us at Alabama, I walk around the training room. I have people call me Brett I want, I'll talk to guys while they're on the table, even if I see them or if they're a client of mine or not, if the coaches ask them to see me or not, I may walk up and talk to, you know, Devonte Smith last year and just say, Hey, great job in the game and sit there and talk to him. Cause of what I want people to realize is that I'm not the boogeyman. I'm not the, Oh my God, you had to go see that guy in that office. I want them to realize like, Hey, Brett's one of the guys, you know, I'm one of the, when I'm hanging out with the gymnastics team, I'm, I'm up there, I'm laughing with them, I'm cutting up with them, and I can still flip the switch. I, I can maintain my boundaries, but I want them to feel comfortable. I don't want them to be like resistant to come see me. I want them to see me as a as an example. Um, and so I think those are critically important to realize. And and you know, I think destigmatizing opens us up. But the mental side of the game is 20 years behind strength and conditioning. So when I was playing ball 30 years ago, like I said, we, we, we did strength conditioning work, but it was more, so my freshman year, we had a guy who was a specialist and he was, he was in the minor league system with the White Sox. His brother was an all American at LSU. We were doing plyo balls. We were doing all those things 30 years ago. That's why I love seeing him. I'm like, oh yeah, we did all those. Yeah. Like man, we did that. We want, we set the record for home runs and pitchers, whatever. We're killing it. He ended up leaving LSU and then we went back to a great guy, superb guy, but he was a bodybuilder. And back then, you know, the stri- football had one strength coach and three GAs. So we got one of the GAs for baseball, but everybody, our workouts were three sets of eight of incline, three sets of eight of bench press, whatever. And I ended up finding somebody on the outside to help me. And I got really strong and fit. And I mean, like I could bend over and put my, and touch my nose on my knees. I mean, it was, I was really, really where I wanted to be. But what happened was during that time, strength and conditioning stopped being corrective. It started being constructive. Like a kid today, I'll always ask, hey, now who's your strength and conditioning guy? I mean, God, they're 14. They're like, oh yeah, I go see so-and-so. Yeah. They're not waiting to say, oh, you have a weakness in your back. Mentally, we're still in that corrective. Hey, who's your, you know, have you ever seen? No, I haven't. You know, I've tried to deal with it, deal with it my own and all the other stuff. Well, we're going to get to the spot where it's constructive as well. We do that a lot at Alabama. We do that a lot of my tour players will call me even before they have an issue um, because they want somebody on their team to deal with it. And soon you're going to see two or three people on people's. But, you know, I think we have to be constructive. We have to be um, the mental game. I think coaches could learn the mental game. Like if we're looking at that, you know, that iceberg, you know, what do we see at the top? Well, motivation, but what made Skip so good was Skip was Skip Skip understood the game. He understood the mental game. He understood about building belief. Coach Saban understands belief. 
you know, not, oh, I know you can do this. You're ready to go. It's, hey, when it's hitting the fan, you're prepared for it. Biggest mistake that we make as coaches is say, I, you know, you guys are ready to go and nobody can beat you. Then what happens if they beat you? Instead, I want people to say, look, you can handle anything that comes your way. Before you called me, as you can tell, a little busy this morning, um, I had a call from one of my players at the British Open. And I said, what do we know about this week? We have to be mentally flexible. We have to be clear on our lines and clear on our intentions, but mentally flexible, which means I can, I can handle anything. I can adapt. That's mental toughness. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of the term, but because I, because the alternative means I'm not tough. No, right. You haven't uncovered where your strength is, but what I want them to understand is that there's nothing that you're going to face that you can't work through. It may be, it may suck. You may feel embarrassed. You may feel frustrated, all that, but it is not going to break you. You can, you can go. We, we, I don't think we as people fear failure. We fear the moment we realize that failure happened mm -hmm. and then we get back to work. And that's just like anything else. We don't fear mistakes. We fear the minute we go, you know, I mean, you know, that moment of like, it's, mm -hmm. When you're watching a football game and you realize it's over, you know what I mean? There's four minutes left to go in the game, but you realize all of a sudden the yeah happens a lot for Ole Miss fans, but um, you get my point. That's all right. Hey man, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I just, I'm having a hard time. I'll be honest because I feel like my podcast usually go in a pretty linear manner and I've got a direct line. What do I say? But every time you keep talking, my mind keeps jumping around to different things. Um, so it's awesome. I mean, I definitely appreciate yeah, your perspective. That's somewhat, that's somewhat of me being. No, well, well this is, me this is a wild. I, I think part of it is it's just an interesting topic that I, I would say I don't know a ton about. Um, I'm interested in learning more. Uh, a question I have, and I, I, I think I already know the answer, but I want to ask it anyway in case anybody else is wondering as well. So when we're talking about players with the yips, are there any commonalities between characteristics or personality types? Is there any, is there anybody that's maybe more likely to see it happen or, or, or more likely to get over it quickly? Um, I see you shaking your head and I, I kind of assumed that was going to be the response. I would, I would, I would, I would say that highly conforming kids may be, or it may be an increased risk. They want to do everything right and they don't want to see it go wrong. Yeah. So I say high conforming, like a kid who's, so I, I think in general, uh, uh, like I said, I think we all have our own psychological fingerprint. Our job is to understand what that fingerprint is. I think that there's two types of people. Um, there's some categories I'll throw out there, but one of them is that you either run hot or you run cold. You tend to be more anxious or you tend to be more chill. Um, I think, there are people who are approachers and they're avoiders. There's people who will approach threat and there's people who will avoid threat. There's not one right or wrong. The avoiders tend to hold back until they see the opening and then they jump. Sometimes approachers jump too soon and cause problems. There are people who are reactors or responders. Um, reactors see stress and they try to go into self-preservation mode. Um, responders see stress and try to use it to make themselves better. Um, I think, you know, those are the different layers to me. So I think the conform, the high conforming kid, the kid who wants to do it right, the kid that wants a lot of self-approval, things like that, um, is, is really somebody who I think is trying to do everything correctly and has this idea, if I do everything right, then I'll succeed. I think there's a certain level of baseball players that we all know, we've all been around them, that don't maybe always have it all together. Yeah. Um, no. Maybe <laughs> are, are a little bit, they're maybe the dudes that show up in their, their socks from last season are still in their shoes. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they're like, what do we got to do? Yeah, I'm going to go out there. Or, you know, there are those guys. I would love to have been that guy. I wasn't that guy, you know. Um, but, I think we have to understand that sometimes those guys aren't going to really have an issue with yips because they're going to be like, whatever, it's no big deal. I think the ones that the more that we attach it magnetically to ourselves as a flaw, that's a higher risk. Yeah. And that makes, that makes perfect sense. That makes, makes complete and total sense. 
Um, I, I'm curious to know, and you've given a ton of great advice. I think that earlier I mentioned the people listening are probably going to be catchers, parents, and coaches. I think everybody's got some takeaways. But but I'm curious to know that, let's say I get an email next week, and they say, Zan, my, my son's going through the yips. We don't know what to do. I'm going to refer him to this podcast, and I'm going to give him your email address. What well, What is kind of step one as you uh, – I'm not sure if you evaluate a person or if you start to speak to them, but I would be curious to know what is the process like when somebody comes to you for guidance on how to get over this? So the first thing I'll do once we, once we meet um, and chat and we do everything now really remotely um, is I want to find out why they think it's happening and what's going on. Then I try to understand the person. Okay. Um, I understand why they're stressed. You know, is it, feel like I'm going to lose playing time. I'm not going to get recruited. I feel like I should, I'm better than this. I should not have to deal with this, those types of things. Um, so I'm going to try to understand them from that perspective. I'm, and then as a psychologist, I use what's, I use a framework. It's called the biopsychosocial approach, which is I'm going to try to understand you, Zan, from a biological perspective, a psychological perspective, and a social interaction perspective. So in other words, I'm going to say, all right, so biologically, have you had any illnesses or problems in your life that you were able to overcome? How'd you do it? You know, when was your, what's your injury history? Are your parents athletes or are they artists? Are they engineers? Think about it. If both parents are engineers. They're going to think differently than both parents who are artists or salesmen or something like that. Um, typically. I'm making a little bit of a, sure, you know, yeah, yeah. judgment, but you Fair get enough. the point. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'm going to want to know, um, you know, how do they handle stress when stress hits them psychologically? I want to know their problem solving strategies. Are they internal or external? In other words, I can do this or somebody's going to do this for me. Um, people who then tend to think that external people are going to solve their problems struggle more than people who say I can take the bit and go with it. Um, I'm going to try to understand what are their belief systems, um, yeah, and it's th- you'll hear things such as, and, I, and I'm not going to say it like that. I'm just going to ask them questions and I'm going to listen yeah. for things. But, you know, sometimes you'll hear kids like, you know, I shouldn't struggle if I put in this much work. That's a very irrational belief set because struggle is where we grow from. And, you know, I don't like the whole idea of, hey, we got to celebrate failure. I'm not saying that. We just got to use it. Um, and um, I want to I wanna know how they... Um, how do they form practice plans? How do they socially interact? What do they see themselves out there? Who's their social support? I'm going to frame this across all of those different perspectives. And once I understand that, then I can get a pretty good understanding and say, okay, look. So one of the tour players I have now that we're talking about, really well-meaning kid, a conscientious, does the work. He's frustrated that it's not going faster. And as much as I'm trying to pull him back on it, he just wants it to go faster. Well, why do you think it's continuing to happen? Because he just wants it faster. He can't ride the wave right now. He's still trying to control it. Um, and so I've got to understand. Now I know why. I mean, I understand in his history why he's that way. But that's okay. You know, it's it's just we're all our own personality. You know, we're my mom was an identical twin. She was born seven minutes before her older, her younger sister. And as they grew, you could see them alike, but they had completely different mannerisms. How? They have exactly the same genetics. Their DNA is identical. How are they different? They are. I mean, it was just, it was bizarre. That's what I want people to realize is that every experience we go through is a unique interaction with us. And then I want to learn and use the stressors in our life to help bring us more into what we're doing. It's okay. Like, it's okay that we're feeling this way. It's okay that I'm stressed going to the ballpark, but what does it mean about you? Like I said, I'm not trying to get into big psychological stuff, but trust me, it's all there. It's in there. If you dig with people, they will, if you get to the, why does this bother you? Like, I understand it should, but what is it with you? You know, you'll get the first answer first. That's the answer. That's the easy answer. Well, it just sucks that I'm having to do that. What's, I don't know if I'm going to get recruited there it is. Yeah. Okay. All right. So what do we have to do to get recruited? You know, I'm sure college coach doesn't want to see a kid with the yips in a high school game. How about if we show a kid 
that gets recruited that overcame the yips. Now, what does that mean to a college coach? Hmm. Probably a lot more because you showed them that you faced it, you learned it, you got in after it, you did what it took and you dealt with it. That would probably show me as a college coach, something that you could handle stress. So we got to learn to see things. For, so can we take that, can we take that power me mechanism and turn it so that I'm in control of what the experience is? Once we do those types of things, we can be really, really powerful with it. Um, the other thing I want to do is also, is like, where do they get their pressure from? Like, is it performance? Is it our kids today, Zan, and you know this, you see this, our kids today, and I'm not trying to be, oh, you know, whatever. Um, they have more stress than we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. The rates of anxiety and, and that I'm seeing are higher than I've ever seen for our youth. It, it's not only COVID. It's the social comparisons. It's the social need to be at the level of success that everyone else is at. It's, I mean, it's unreal. And, you know, I'm 48. My senior year, I only played one year of varsity baseball, so I wasn't going to get drafted or anything like that. But the number one pick in the draft was supposed to be a kid by the name of Todd Van Poppel. He was all over. He was from Texas. He was all over every baseball America there was. But he didn't want to sign with um, the Atlanta Braves because they were garbage back then. And he kept saying, I'm going to Texas. I'm going to Texas. I'm going to the University of Texas. So at the last minute, the Atlanta Braves decided to draft a, a shortstop from Jacksonville, Chipper Jones. None of us knew who that dude was in Louisiana. Yeah. I remember all of us going, like, who the hell is Chipper Jones? Yeah. Now the draft happened the other night. Everybody knows who all these kids are. They got a million followers. Yeah. Right? Everybody's on social media follow. I can watch what a pitcher's doing who's, okay, I'll say this, um, Jack Leiter. What a ridiculous college pitcher that kid was. Yeah. <laughs> but he was also draft eligible as a sophomore. Mm -hmm. Okay. I graduated high school when I was 17. He obviously graduated high school when he was 19. Two years developmentally different. So we have to be very careful on our social comparisons. That's what scares me about college recruiting, that we're recruiting sophomores. I had played one year varsity baseball because I was so small, I didn't grow, I was behind the growth. I should have been held back for athletic purposes, right? But let's instead turn this with the kid that sees me and says, what are you gonna learn about yourself? Who are you gonna become in this? Versus everything has to follow a simple thing or, oh yeah, I offered a kid as a sophomore. Well, what about the kid who's starting to throw 94 as a senior? Should we just let that kid go? Yeah. No, I mean, I can give you, you know, number after number after number of kids that emerged out of nowhere to be superstars, but many co many coaches would have overlooked them because they didn't fit the model. Yeah. So I want to know what that kid is. What what are they willing to fight? And so when I'm talking to them, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Well, I, I love where you're going with that, and and obviously that's why you're a professional, and we're all not. Um, but you, you're digging for things that are listening to you, it makes complete, perfect, 100% sense, but it's non-obvious to maybe somebody who doesn't deal with this every day or is not used to dealing with mental performance at this high yeah, but, level. But I, but I want you to realize this, right? So we created about a year ago, a concept called the Catalyst School, which was a school, it was a weekly, and now we do it twice a month because we realized we were giving, the people were overwhelmed with the amount of information. But Catalyst School is a coaching based platform where we do two live webinars a month and all kinds of other material. It's 20 bucks a month for a coach. I mean, come on, it's amazing. But um, what we, because I, I went to LSU, I have to spell things out. So Catalyst, the first C is connection to the people you coach. That's the number one. It doesn't matter what philosophy you have. It doesn't matter how good your bunt defenses are. It doesn't matter how great your launch angles are. If you are not connected to your kid, they're not going to play for you. But if you're connected to them, you understand them, you know them, you know what makes them tick, you know why they're important, you know why they're a value in your life, you know, you know, hey, I mean, I'm not asking you to get into the drama of their girlfriends and stuff like that, but if you don't know that they're having drama with their girlfriend and you don't know that they're coming in stressed because they can't separate, then you're not connected to them. You just assume that that's just, that should go. 
No, you got to have empathy for that. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you a story. I told this to coach B and coach Bianco. Um, I being a fifth year senior and Mike had Mike's freshmen were my juniors, my freshman year. So if you think about it, like the, the, the hierarchy of classes. So I was mentored by the guys he mentored. And, um, and so we're, um, you know, I'm sitting there and we're my senior year, we're taking batting practice and I'm hitting fungos and I'm standing next to him at the cage. And he looks at me and I had just gotten engaged um, to my wife. And he said, you know, he said, there's the greatest song that's ever been sung is the Garth Brooks song, Unanswered Prayers. He said, I look back at my life and realize when I met Cammie, his wife, he said, I'm sure there was others out there that I thought that I wanted to marry. I thought it was going to be for life, but it wasn't until I looked around and realized that I have the best option right here in front of me. I have the best person who makes me better right here in front of me. And I say, and I tell Mike that all the time because I, I've never forgotten that conversation. Now he, why was he connected to me in that way? At that time he was coaching hitters. He wasn't coaching pitchers, but he coached pitchers a couple of years before when I was there, but we had, and I told him, I said, that was such a connected conversation for me. And he's like, yeah, I don't even remember that. And I'm like, you don't need to. But that told me you were connected to me because you were willing to have that conversation. You, I just got engaged. You know, I was talking to him about going to marriage encounter in the Catholic church and all these others engaged encounter and all these other things. And I said, you opened up and had a conversation like that. I said, I've always thought of that whenever I think of you, you know? And it's funny, I know players that play from like Brett Basham are all like, wow, he's that personal. I'm like, yes, but he is. But that's how I, re but that's connection. Coach Burtman used to walk the outfield just to talk to guys. And we'd be like, oh God, he's coming my way. I'm gonna go get that ball. But what he was doing was he was just trying to get to understand us, not to use it against us, just to be a human connection. Yeah. And as coaches, we have to know our people first. And we have to know like, all right, I had a kid who came and saw me. We've all seen these kids. Dad didn't play high school sports, but wanted to, didn't have the opportunity. So dad wants everything for his kid. And this kid was a really solid pitcher. I mean, really good, really intelligent too. And the dad would yell from the stands, do this, do this, do this. Kids in high school, right? And the kid finally looks at the dad in the session because literally in the session, when I was in person, he was sitting here and behind him was his dad. I mean, what a phenomenal symbology. Okay. The dad is sitting behind him and he was a strong New Yorker and he would, you know, whatever. And, uh, he's sitting there and he goes, and this kid goes, dad, you think you're helping me, but you're not one. You're not right. And two, I already know what to do. I'd rather us talk about it at night and just talk baseball. Let me show you what I know too. Yeah. And the dad goes, it's not helping you. He goes, no, it's not. It's actually confusing me. And the dad was like, oh my God. Like he really thought yelling, what, they're going to throw a breaking ball is going to help you or stay back was going to help him. And the kid had the guts to say, dad, it's not helping me. I don't mean to hurt your feelings. It's not helping me. Yeah. I think that's, those are some things that we have to, we just have to know our kids, man. We just got to know the people we lead. Yeah. And if you don't know them, you don't need to have the, you're not leveraging it against them. You're not anything, but just my God, if somebody's going to be vulnerable with you, they got to feel safe. Yeah. You well, can get on them. You don't have to love, you don't have to love them to the point that they don't get better. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's obviously great advice. And I think it, it does get overlooked. And I think that's what, that's what coaching is all about. It's about getting to know your players, having that personal connection, uh, you know, having those important and meaningful um, relationship. So I, I think that's a, a fantastic place to start. When I say coaching, I, I think most people think of being a coach on a field, but a mental performance coach, it's absolutely no different as well. No. Uh, so, and so that's why we call it cat being a catalyst because we are responsible for the growth and the success of other individuals, not a hundred percent responsible, even 1% responsible. Yeah. We have a, a certain level of, of uh, importance that are there. Yeah. Well, that's a great perspective. And I, I kind of want you to kind of follow up on that a little bit. So if that's kind of step one, you know, of, of a new, you know, client per se, or a new someone coming yep. to, to work with you, 
what would the follow-up be? So uh, again, step one, I'm completely summarizing it is you're going to really yep. get to know that player, get to know what makes him tick, what his fears are, um, so on and so forth. But moving forward, kind of after the initial assessment, how often do you talk to a player or when do you talk to them? Is it, is, do you do it scheduled or is it? So, so the way we set up our program, if, if there is what I call the elite program. And, and this was actually formed by a, a parent. So I don't believe that people need to see me weekly. One, what I charge is not feasible. And two, you don't need to see me every week. Okay. But what you do have is access to me. So what we do is my wife, if you're in my elite program, my wife calls near the first of the month and gets you scheduled for when you want to be scheduled during the month. And you get priority scheduling. And if I have a new client, they get fit in in between. And then we schedule you, but during those months, you have unlimited access to me on phone and text and everything. So what, you know, if you're going to a game and you're like, Hey, can I chat with you real quick? Yeah, absolutely. Now, one of the things that I've done is I've learned, and this is crazy. This is completely counter to what I would have ever thought. Um, I, I like people when they text me, not because it's easier for me. Like I'll talk to kids all day long. It's texting is a form of writing. When they text it, they have to be more, they have to be more present with what they're trying to say. When they call me, I get verbal diarrhea, kind of like me on a podcast, like, right, I just go. And I don't think, I'm just more like, Bleh! there it is. And I'm like, okay, now what do I do about it? Well, you don't even know what you just said. So I think it's important that every player journal, they, they take notes about what they did well each day, what they didn't do well, how they're going to improve. And when they text me, what a lot of times happen is I'll say, read your text again. And they'll read it and the answer's in there but I want them to become their own master. I want them, I'm a guide, you're a guide. Let's guide them to the answers, okay? Let's bring them closer to where we're trying to get them to go because they can't do what you're telling them to do in the heat of the moment. They have to do what they're trained to do, which means they have to trust themselves, okay? Um, so they have access to me, they can call me, you know. Some kids call me a lot, some kids don't call me at all. That's fine. It, it, it has nothing to do with anything, but if they need something, they can call me um, and go from there. Well, uh, I'm glad you said that because I've kind of recognized something similar with, with the guys that I work with privately. Uh, I, I'm the same. When when we're working together, if you want to call me, text me, do whatever, you know, I, I'm open access. It seems like in my experience, and this is not always true for every player, um, but it seems like the guys who are the most successful are the ones that don't completely rely on me and need me need to text me every single day asking about this or talking yep. about that. It's the guys who, you know, we talk, we we go over the plan, we make adjustments, and then they go execute it. Um, and I think that really goes back to what something you said earlier. Uh, you, you know, looking for an external um, uh, people who are looking, you know, for for there to help to come externally or for it to come internally. Uh, and it seems like, you know, a lot of those guys uh, j just seem to have more success when they take ownership of it. You know, yes, I talk yeah. with you, we work on things, but then they say, okay, now it's time for me to go to work and I'm going to fix it. Not I'm well, going to text Zan and Zan's going to fix it. And this is why, or I'm going to talk to Dr. Brett. Well, we, Dr. Brett's gonna... Yeah. But that's the same thing as like, you know, my wife will, if the kids are old enough, she'll text the kid to see when they want to have the appointment. And she'll may say, Hey, text the parent. I've texted them three times. Try to get the appointment scheduled. Can you know, you want to jump in? The reason is I want them to have the responsibility and the ownership. I don't want mom to pack their bag. I don't want mom to pack their, their snacks on the road. I don't. Okay. Mom or dad can do their laundry because if not, they may screw it up, but they need to learn how to do it. They need to learn how to get the laundry down by a certain time. So it can be washed, not waiting until eight o'clock at night to leave at nine o'clock in the morning. Um, that sense of responsibility is critical. You know, is, is, is everything there. Right. Um, and that's the same thing that I would say with, with this stuff, right. Is once they start taking that ownership, it starts getting better and better, and more successful. And the better it gets, the more successful it gets, the, um, you know, the, the more that, that we feel comfortable to manage it. And I don't expect them to have the answers. What I expect them to have is the desire to step into it and the realization that they can manage it. If they do those things, look, I'll, I'll work with somebody who fails all day long. Look, here's one of the big things in this society, in this culture today, kids today, 
athletes today, even my perform my professionals, I don't think they give a hundred percent. I think that they subconsciously hold back about five to 10, 15%. And the reason is this, it is very, very, very exposing to give a hundred percent and fail Mm. because that means you're simply not good enough that day. But if I hold a little bit back, I just subconsciously don't hold, don't give it all. Then I have a reason as to why I failed. Why didn't I, I didn't, I didn't give it everything I had. That is, right. that, didn't, that, yeah, that's really wise. A lot of wisdom in that. And, and, and it's, but players are so afraid of not being good enough. But maybe you're just not good enough yet. Yeah. Like, and true story, I'm not trying to tout my success, but I'm so thankful to my mom and dad. My dad was a catcher at, at University of Toledo. So, um, you know, he caught way back when in the sixties, but, um, going into my, so my sophomore year at LSU, at Catholic high in Baton Rouge, the all boys Catholic school, prominent baseball school. Um, I was on junior varsity. I pitched very little. I would also catch as a, I was like the second or third string catcher. Um, and so when we went into the summer and Louisiana summers are not, not for the faint of heart, um, we would be batting practice every day before we played and we had a really good team. Well, I'd catch batting practice for two hours every day before a game in the summer heat. It's brutal. Br- well, I knew by the time I went to the game, I wasn't going to play. And I pitched twice all summer, three times all summer. Um, and I, I hated this coach. I hated him. I, I wanted to quit. I was getting you know screwed over. And, and maybe I, I deserved to play. Maybe I didn't. But my dad, I mean, why he wasn't happy with it, he's like, look, you just got to fight like hell the next opportunity you get. And I remember one game I threw a no hitter. One game I beat the number one team. Okay, and then I got I got to pitch in the playoffs. And I got shelled. It happens. Um, the next year though, I played junior varsity again. Then I played on that summer league team. Then we went and won some national World Series. I don't know, not like a, a weekend World Series, like yeah. a real tournament. Um, but and I remember I look back and think, you know, those summers catching batting practice, man, that made me that that formed who I was I hated it it would have been easy to transfer schools go somewhere else and get playing time but catching that batting practice in the middle of a hundred degree heat cramping up you know you're not peeing for hours afterwards because you know whatever sucks sucks um so um you know you just got to know you just got to know who you are and you got to know what makes you tick Man, that, that is, uh, I think you, every time we talk, you continue to hit the nail on the head and bring up excellent points that uh, I think is very valuable for me, but also for the people listening as well. And I know we've been probably going a little bit over an hour, and I, I think you've got to get off here shortly. So I want to respect your time. But uh, Brett, man, definitely appreciate you jumping on. I've learned a ton today. I know the people who are listening uh, will learn a lot as well. And obviously I'll put your contact information below. I'll put it on the screen yeah, so people can find it. Um, but once again, please just go ahead and mention uh, where people can find you. And I know you mentioned a couple of services and, and or groups and things you have, uh, programs. Uh, if you want to talk about those briefly for anyone who's interested. Yeah. Ahead. You know, one of the things for coaches that we do, and, and I priced it for $20 a month. And, and the reason is, is um, I don't want to ever have a barrier from financial reasons. Um, and, $20 a month, multiple calls, live webinars. They're all recorded. we got about 100 to 150 coaches on there. I've got some coaches who never attended a live webinar and they send me messages every week. And it's a variety of topics. We'll have some guests on there. It's, um, it's just a really cool thing. It's called the Catalyst uh, School, Catalyst Live. And it's been a really nice organic thing. I don't do any marketing to it. I don't try to grow. I just, people come in, they leave, they come in, they leave. It's cool. And I just, I, I enjoy it because it's my coach. Some weeks we have one person on the live call. It's not the greatest for my ego, but I'll give everything I have to that one coach, 20 bucks a month. Um, you go to catalystschool.com. If you go to my website, it's all in there. Um, and, you know, I've got a new book coming out soon uh, called Break Free from Suckville, which is uh, an idea that we're always falling short of our potential. And as a result, we reject our reality we need to start embracing our reality because we're never going to hit our potential. 
will there never be a day where we achieved our full potential because every day we have success, we move that line. Um, and I think it's, um, I think it's one of those things that um, the more that we can understand who we are and that we can, like I said, manage those things, the better we're going to be. And I want to do that. And those are the main things I got going on right now. Um, we've got some webinars out there. We've got some other things. I still have my podcast, The Secrets to Winning. I've been a little bit quieter on my podcast front just to finish the book up, um, but I'll pick it back up again pretty soon. It's been going on for about four years. Um, and, uh, you know, I just enjoy what I do and I'm busy and, and I like it, but it's the coolest job there is. Well, you're obviously very good at it. And that's why, uh, that's why I wanted to reach out to you and, and talk to you and get to learn a little bit more from you, but, uh, definitely appreciate your time. Like I said, I know you got to go, so I don't want to hold you up any longer, but, uh, well, I'll put your contact info up here for everybody. And I would encourage anyone, if, if you have a question about throwing or blocking, Hey man, I'm your guy. If you have a question about, uh, the, ifs, yes, <laughs> Brett, you're, he's your yes. guy. So, uh, I'll yes. have everybody reach out to you. You're kind of my, my direct line for anybody who's going through that. So uh, appreciate your time. Appreciate everything you shared today. And uh, let's talk again soon. You got it, Zan. Thanks.